ESPN Classic Sports Century. I'm Chris Fowler. welcomes you to the following presentation of the National Football League. I'm Hugh Culverhouse. I'd like to tell you why the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to be a success. In our first football game, I thought we didn't have a chance to win. <laughs> we, we just weren't good enough. I bombed as badly as anybody's ever done in, in the history of the league. some players the first year if their heart was beating and their arms were warm they were on the field the team was bad but the coach was good i don't know what we'd have done if we had a nobody we were the, the butt of jokes around the country around the world it had to teach us a lot about life that is an experience that will be with me for the rest of my life you can always debate which was the greatest NFL dynasty? Lombardi's Packers, the Steel Curtain in Pittsburgh, Don Shula's Dolphins, throw in Landry's Cowboys, Walsh's 49ers. You can make an argument for any of them. But when it comes to picking the worst team of all time, there's no debate. It's the 1976 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They went 0 and 14, didn't win a single game. And we were with them every step of the way documenting their first season in the NFL. One Buccaneer place becomes the new home of the Bucks in June of 1976. The football team takes its character from its people. And only when 40 men take the field for the first time as members of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will the birth of the Bucks be complete. This is the 25th anniversary of that season. So we thought we'd revisit that team and the year they made the worst kind of football history. Well, I, I got very friendly with uh, Hugh Culverhouse, the original owner of the Bucks. He uh, was very interested in NFL films and what we were doing. And since he had a brand new team, he, he was interested to see that we documented it well. May I say that we're here for one reason and one reason only. That's to bring the fans great professional football. And he said, Ed, I want to give you anything you want here. I want this to be a good, a good history of the Buccaneers. You knew NFL films were around all the time. It was kind of a given. So it wasn't a distraction to me, but I think it was for Coach and, and the guys that came from SC because they were used to a much more controlled environment. It was his first professional team. He was coming from the college ranks, and although it was a high-profile school, USC, I don't think he was used to having this much attention being paid to him by NFL Films. Well, they can't come out on the field. We never allow yeah. a camera in SC. Gentlemen, if you don't get that camera out there, I'm going to shove it right up your... At first, McKay was so well, conscious of our wireless mic, he actually covered it with his hat when one of his assistants tried to talk to him. There's a cold beer if you'd like one in Mr. Culverhouse's office for the coaches. You really find out who will catch the ball. It took a while, but finally the coach lightened up enough to include us in his jokes. It's just a matter of finding out who will catch the ball in traffic, and I think that will be the telling factor as to who we actually end up keeping. Well, that ought to be a son of a mother. <laughs> I was laughing so hard, I couldn't hold the camera steady. That's a great idea. <laughs> and you can print that. It's strictly on the record. <laughs> now, you've heard the term outtakes. Well, in films, it means mistakes, flubs, 
You know, all the kinds of embarrassing things you leave on the cutting room floor. Well, imagine trying to make a film with nothing but outtakes. That's the problem we faced with Birth of the Bucks. You're gonna run the curl. You're gonna hustle. It's all right. If you had to catch his mid, you'd have caught it. Put down, I'll change this drill. This looks like a fire drill in a third grade school. I don't think anybody will make the Olympic team on this squad at this time. You know, sometimes you question whether your memory is accurate, especially after 25 years. So I was sort of curious to look at this footage again to see if the Bucks were really as bad as I remembered. And I discovered, no, they were actually worse. Everything about the Buccaneers seemed wrong from the start. Even the uniform design and logo. I thought they were terrible. I thought they were ugly. Remind me of a pirate movie I saw with Earl Flynn. You know, Earl Flynn had one of those pirate hats on with the pirate on the side and the color. And I, I just, I just, I didn't like it. Uh, I didn't think it would go well in the NFL, but those were the colors that were chosen by the ownership. So we, we went with it. But I didn't like it. I mean, the players didn't like it either. When we had a lot of the orange on, we looked like big cream sickles. We weren't fond of the colors. He didn't look too frightful. It was supposed to be a swashbuckler, but he looked more looks like a happy fellow on the side of the helmet. One person who appreciated the uniform was the man who lived with it every day. Equipment manager, Pat Marcacello. I think it's a great looking logo. I think it's a great looking logo. It was originally going to be called Tampa Bay Orange and uh, NFL property, so let's call it Florida Orange. So that's what it goes by, it's Florida Orange. People say it's Tennessee Orange, it's not. It's not Tennessee Orange and it's not uh, Texas Orange. It's just, uh, it's a different orange, and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are the only ones that use it. I thought it was a pretty sharp logo. Of course, I'm going to, because my feelings were getting hurt by all this constant criticism of, of this uniform and the, uh, and the helmet. It's true. People around the league laughed at the Bucks' uniforms. Mike Ditka called them the Pastel Patsies. Some people called it Bruce, Bruce the Buccaneer. That's because they lost. I'll guarantee you they'd have been manly enough if, if they'd have won. We know that. Circuit City presents Expo 2001. 30 days of what's new, what's hot, and what's next. Featuring live demos of HDTV, digital photography, high-speed internet access, and more. All this month at Circuit City. Circuit City, we're with you. Acura 3.5 RL with satellite length navigation system. Today at IBM.com, Leon and Mike from Corporate are here to talk about the incredibly powerful IBM Net Vista A series. This computer is so great, you could alter the trajectory of interstellar spacecraft. No, we can't say that legally. It has a super powerful Intel Pentium 4 processor, 1.5 gigahertz, 20 gig hard drive, 128 megs of RAM, 999. You could predict the weather years in advance with pinpoint accuracy and. Uh -uh. Decode the human genome with this bad boy. Leon. Defeat a Russian chess champion, which yes, is not... Leon. The Net Vista A series is perfect for power-hungry small businesses. It's backed by IBM with an Intel Pentium 4 processor, so it can run multiple business apps at once. Enhanced multimedia, 3D collaboration, voice recognition software. You could clone the girl who sat behind you in homeroom. Leon. Leon. Order the seriously fast Net Vista A22P for $9.99. Just call or click today. Hey, Mike, just... Let's loosen the tie a little bit, you know what I mean, buddy? It's not me. It's the legal system. Can you believe this ball game is Jay? Little roller up along first. Behind the back! It gets Buster! You're watching ESPN Classic. When Bucks owner Hugh Culverhouse hired John McKay away from Southern Cal in 1976, he got not only the most celebrated coach in college football at the time, but a man with a keen sense of humor. Don't forget to take off your shoes, please. That's the only thing we're going to get right today is the shoes, I think. You know, his little quips and his, his one-liners were original and they were funny. and He could have been on the stage as a stand-up comic. 
it bothers me that they have picked us to be the worst team in football because what they're doing now is challenging your physical and your mental capacity and my ability to coach. Now this, this hurts me. Second worst team, I could stand it, but not the worst team. He did have a great sense of humor and that uh, there were times when things were very difficult that he would come up with a line that uh, really did help the situation, particularly with the media. I've broken down the expansion teams and they've averaged winning 2.7 games their first year, which to me is rather difficult. I figured the two, but the point seven has got me wondering what the hell is going on. One of the reporters after a dismal game said, uh, Coach, how do you feel about your team's execution? And he looked back, he says, I'm all for it. Well, another one that I thought was pretty funny, he was asked, well, uh, you know, uh, well, Coach Ricky Bell carried the ball about, you know, about 30 times today, and uh, that, that's an awful lot. And, and Coach said, well, he didn't think it was that much because uh, the ball is not that heavy. There's millions of them. I, I still like the one where the initial kicker, Pete Rejecki, uh, you know, did say, he was quoted in the paper saying that, that my dad uh, you know, really intimidated him and made him nervous. And my dad's come back to it was, well, we've got a problem because I intend to go to all the games. John McKay's sense of humor seemed to rub off on the fans. I remember a banner hanging in the end zone that season. It read, Bucks Fever, catch it because our receivers can't. Now just concentrate, remember his name. Hey, you. When McKay was winning four national championships at SC, he had a quip for every occasion. But in Tampa, the laughs, like the victories, came hard. It was hard for him. You know, he was used to winning national championships. And all of a sudden, you're losing. We'll have a brunch at 10.30. There'll be no wake up at 10.30. Curfew tonight is at midnight. You'll have dinner and meet for the meetings at 7 to 8 o'clock. And you're free from 8 to 12, which is a time enough to do most anything. John McKay died earlier this year. In his final interview with us in 1998, he talked about how much harder it was back then to build an expansion team. Back then, in 1976, there was no free agent market, and the new teams weren't awarded bonus picks in the draft. They had to play almost exclusively with castoffs from the other teams. I think the National Football League should be ashamed of how they did it before. Uh, it was not fair to the fans, not fair to the owners, certainly not fair to the coaches. And uh, you just didn't have any chance. He has very fond memories of the players and the guys that hung in and the guys that survived it and the guys that made it to 77. I think he was just the right fit uh, for the Buccaneers at the time. And he was sure right for us. And he was for us, for these newspapers and these fans, because the team was bad, but the coach was good. I don't know what we'd have done if we had a nobody. And to put that 1976 season in perspective, consider this. The Bucks were shut out five times. They averaged nine points a game. And they're the only team to finish a season with more players on injured reserve than touchdowns scored. 17 players on IR, 15 touchdowns. That's a bad season. When McKay went to Tampa, he brought along several assistants from Southern Cal, including Wayne Fonts and Dick Beam. Beam's duties were many and varied. Dick Beam was, he was the fix-it man. Whenever we had a problem, Beam was in charge of fixing it and getting it right. Go around each one of these groups, Dick. If anybody's having any shoe trouble, get them off right now. We'll get some other shoes on. I remember Dick Beam as the guy that followed Coach McKay around. That's what I remember most about him. He was, to me, more a handyman than anything because he, he was the guy, to me, that made sure Coach McKay had a cigar or made sure whatever Coach McKay need, you know, he had it or... I think that's, that's too harsh. I think anybody on that staff would have lit John's cigars because if he asked you to light his cigar, I'd have lit it. He was more than a gopher. I mean, he, he did, took care of all the administrative work and, and, and Beam was good because, uh, you know, he looked out for Coach. You know, I mean, he had been with Coach at SC and he looked out for him and uh, that was kind of important in those days i think to have someone there a buffer you know because uh, 
It, it, it got a little nasty that first year. Come on up here for me so they get a good shot. Okay. Today, Dick is still with the NFL. From Miami, number 58, Mike Each year at the Super Bowl, he directs the pregame introductions. It's a job he learned in Tampa 25 years ago. Dick owns several businesses, including a beauty salon in Orlando, and that's where we caught up with him for this interview. Uh, continue to roll three. Okay. There were three of us that came from the SC staff, and a lot of them, uh, other coaches, were personal friends of Coach McKay's, and, and we thought we were really putting something together good. For Wayne Fonts, this was his first opportunity on, to coach in the pros, and he was excited about it. Put your head, head down, but, but look at me. Come straight ahead now. Something about the anatomy. Your body will follow your head. And I'll tell you what, guys. Coach McKay won't stand for the best player, or even the worst player, to loaf on the practice field. If you don't give 100% out here, you're going to be gone. You will be gone. You will cut yourself. Let's go. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's move it, move it. He was the Bucks' secondary coach. But you see the enthusiasm here that helped him climb the ladder to head coach in Detroit. Calvin, that's the way to come back with it. Good job. That's a good job. That's a damn good job. Way to come back with that football. Wayne had two identities. One for work and one for fun. He loved to look at other women, never did anything, but I loved to look at him. And he said his name was Fonts before five, but Fontes after five. And Coach Fontes after the sun goes down. <laughs> yeah, that was always a joke. <laughs> revolutionary GE Profile Arctica. The first refrigerator that can thaw a filet in half the time. It can chew wine in minutes, help keep lettuce naturally crisp, all while using up to 40% less energy, which makes your kitchen the one place it belongs. The GE Profile Arctica. The refrigerator. Rethought. Reinvented. Revolutionized. Bruno Appliance. Two locations to serve you in Warren and St. Clair Shores. Tomorrow on ESPN, a preview of Pardon the Interruption. Then it's Wednesday Night Hockey with the Stars Blues, followed by Sports Center and Baseball Tonight. On ESPN 2, RPM Tonight at 6, followed by NFL Tonight, and later a documentary on one of the longest NFL games ever played. And on ESPN Classic, Sports Century profiles Hank Greenberg. Then Sports Center looks back on the top stories of the 80s, later a profile of Dan Gable, and catch the new 24 hour ESPN News this time I would like for you to meet the staff of the team that we've gotten together so far. Ron Wolf. Ron is a vice president of operations. He was head of the Oakland Raiders uh, personnel for 13 years and Ron is uh, number one man. In 1976, Ron Wolf was the chain-smoking workaholic general manager of the Buccaneers. At 37, he was a bright young guy, but he aged rapidly that first season. I came in, I was too cocky, too confident. I was not as smart as I thought I was. This was my big opportunity to go in and show everybody in the National Football League that I could run a franchise. I bombed as badly as anybody's ever done in, in the history of the league. Well, that's a frank appraisal. No, it is, that's the truth. I think the main thing the Tampa Bay Buccaneers need are quality football players in order to become competitive uh, the biggest thing we're trying to avoid is being embarrassed in the National Football League this season. It was on-the-job training. We were learning on the job, and it, uh, during my watch, we set a standard in Tampa Bay that'll never be topped in the National Football League. 0 oh, and 26. I cringe every time I hear that, and I root for a lot of people to break that, but I know that'll, that'll be one record that'll never be broken. Ron's fortunes improved considerably when he went to Green Bay in 1991. He built a team that won three straight division titles, back-to-back -back conference championships, and a Super Bowl in 1997. Well done to the fans of Green Bay. This 
is yours as much as it is ours, and we thank you very much for that. When we interviewed Ron, he had just announced his retirement as general manager in Green Bay. He was far removed from that 76 season, but he did have some fond memories of his time in Tampa Bay. The one thing that happened to me in Tampa, the, the greatest thing that's ever happened to Ron Wolf, is I met my wife there. We've had 22 years of marriage now. We have two children. And it's, uh, even though we went 0 and 26, the best thing that ever happened to me was I, I met my wife there. Um, That'll be on the <laughs> floor, I know. I put that in there. I put that, just throw that in there. Get that out of there. <laughs> the most impressive statistics associated with the 1976 Bucks all belong to Abe Gibron the team's wide-body defensive coordinator. We have a coach by the name of Abe Gibran that I truly love. He's a super guy, but I do get headaches when I have to order his uh, coaching gear. As you can see in these coaching shorts, he uh, has about a 50 waist, and up to a normal person's size, you can see the difference. And uh, just talking about Abe's clothes in general, he has a size 11 Triple E shoe. His waist size is about 50. He wears a um, 4X shirt He's just a very large person. Five, three, a cartoon character, one of the all-time great guys. God didn't invent many ABs. You know, his upper body was like a sumo wrestler, but uh, from his waist down, he was one part of a ball player. From his waist up, he was another. His behind just kind of went this way, and his waist went that way, so it just didn't work. The funny thing about Abe was that he was big, and yet Let's go. he was quick Let's on his go. feet. If Abe starts to run and starts to chuckle, his pants will always go down to his knees. They have to always hitch him up. Let's go. Come on. Come on, Coxville. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Bring it in. Pants. Don't fight for it. Everything pulls your pants down. He was a real character. He was fun to be around. Gosh, he was fun to be around. We have head of our pro scouting is Tom Bass from Cincinnati Bengals. Tom Bass. Director of pro personnel Tom Bass looked like a James Bond villain. But inside that menacing body beat the heart of a poet. Tom Bass was probably as, uh, I thought, as much of a, a, a two-personality person as I'd ever seen. He was so gentle when he'd write poetry and then recite it to you, and then you see what a hulk of a man he was. Yeah, he was intimidating. Uh, very gruff and, and uh, tough, tough guy. I, if I was in a fight, I'd want him on my side, not the other side. One important thing that I remember about him is he writes poetry, and he's really very, very good. He has several books of poetry out on the market now. Today, Bass is retired and lives near the beach in Carlsbad, California. Yeah, I enjoy the water. I think the water is important to my life. Yeah, I started writing poetry when, when I was coaching because I didn't have a lot of time to write anything else. I feel the pain at odd moments throughout the day. It serves as a constant reminder of the price that sometimes must be paid for a brief few moments of glory and success. It's never really there on those Sunday afternoons when for 20 weeks I lose myself in playing, becoming so involved I forget about my body, loving just to play. There can be no doubt who will be the loser in the end, but I would have it no other way. Pro football is my way of life, and part of me shall die the year I can no longer play. why Geico's here 24 hours a day every day Geico 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance honey the one thing I need you to do today is open an Ameritrade account okay Yeah. Oh, 
open a cash account and get a free six-month premium membership to Morningstar.com. Some restrictions apply. Call 1-800-AMERITRADE. Discover Card gets you on Game Day Challenge. Log on to ESPN.com, keyword Discover Card, and enter your predictions. Win the chance to appear on January 1st with the hosts of College Game Day, Fowler, Corso, and Herb Street at the Rose Bowl, and test your wits against the greatest minds in college football. Tampa Bay Buccaneer promotional film roll three. We didn't know what to expect when we started filming Birth of the Bucks during the 1976 training camp. We'd never done this before, follow a team literally from its first day of existence right through the season. It was a test for our camera crews, but it was more of a test for the coaches who had just eight weeks to mold this collection of misfits into an NFL team. I remember the very first day when a really a ragamuffin bunch of kids came under that goalpost trying to look important, trying to look like the National Football League. We had so much enthusiasm that we had a team in Tampa. That first summer camp, we'd go out there and say, hey, we're going to win some games. It's not, the team's not going to be bad. It's not going to be a typical expansion team. But then uh, reality came in later on. As far as the talent is concerned, I was shocked. We had players that probably couldn't have played at the University of Southern California on our second team. And they were starting for us. Our first couple staff meetings, we were looking at each other saying, wow, we have a ways to go here. Good. Yeah. We went through 140-some players the first year. If their heart was beating and their arms were warm, they were on the field. We basically got a lot of guys that nobody else wanted, including me. Uh, I played nine years at San Francisco, only played about one of the nine years, so I was very expendable. We had our names on pieces of tape stuck to the front of our helmets so that you know, we'd know who each other was, so the coaches would know who each other was. A uh, collection of guys from all over the place getting together. I mean, in the, the first day, people introducing uh, people to, you know, to one another. Nobody knew who anybody was. I introduced myself to one guy, a guy named Pornell Dickinson, who was one of our quarterbacks. I said, I'm John McKay. He went, you're the coach? I didn't think I looked that old at the time. The only thing more depressing than the practices was the heat. I'll tell you one thing, it seems to me like it got hotter since we came out here. Uh, I remember going out for the first practice and looking around at all these guys, and they were all dying. I mean, it was just so humid and hot. I've never been in such warm conditions as there were here in, in uh, July and August. Different kind of heat. <laughs> It was very humid. You could set your watch by it. We actually welcomed the daily rain showers that would interrupt practice. I thought the thunder and lightning was a better show than the Buccaneers. Every day after practice, the rains come, adding to the mind-bending sameness of summer camp. The players found out that Coach McKay was deathly afraid of lightning. And the minute lightning was anywhere around, you know, he'd call out practice. When he saw it in the distance, we got off the field. He didn't want to take any chances. The thunder and lightning was incredible. I can remember one day, Steve Sable looks at me and he goes, Hank, let's go up this roof here and shoot some of this lightning. Other than the control tower at the airport, Hank McElwee and Steve Sable were the highest things in the area in an amazing electrical storm. And I can remember we had trash bags on his raincoat. And we're standing on this metal roof, and there's lightning going all around us. And I'm saying to myself, this is it. We're not, we're, there's no way we're not going to get struck by lightning. The most memorable scene in Birth of the Bucks involved a free agent rookie halfback from the University of Illinois named John C. Wilson. Two years away from the game have begun to erode his skills. But perhaps an even greater indictment is his difficulty in learning the plays. Well, I know I'm not doing too good as far as mental, but um, I think you're taking me along a little slow because I'm a little slow in learning, but I can learn. The hardest thing, it has to be the mental aspect. I study a lot. You know, I'm trying, I'm about, I'm about, I about got it down now, just about. Now, Hank and I had positioned our camera at the far end of the field, and we were rolling when John McKay told the rookie he was cut. It was the first time we'd ever captured anything like that on film. Uh -huh. We're going to have to let you go. Right. But I think you've worked real hard, Johnny, on it and things. But I think there's two or three guys that haven't played as much in the last year or two. And I think it's tough to come back, you know. I think you've lost some of your speed. Do you feel like you've lost some of your speed? Well, no, not really. But, like, 
Uh, Grime must have went kind of bad on me. Mm -hmm. John C. Wilson never caught on with another team, and he quietly faded from sight, except for those occasions when we would rerun that footage. Now, when we were putting this film together, we thought, now here is the ultimate lost treasure, John C. Wilson. Let's see if we can find it. We put our entire research staff to work trying to track down the elusive John C. Wilson. It took about six of us making calls for about two months. It was a very tedious process to go through. Hi, this is Chris Hangley. I'm calling from NFL Films. We're trying to track down a John C. Wilson. He tried out for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in 1976. It's After weeks of dead ends, finally, Erica Pitt found our man. He was living in the tiny town of Kings Tree, South Carolina. I was so excited that after all these phone calls, I, f I actually found him. Like, it was done. Ah! Ah! <laughs> You'll never believe it! You'll never believe it! And she, and she told us, I got him! I got him! I finally got him! <laughs> Don't go anywhere now! Don't go anywhere now! I finally got him! <laughs> Now, there isn't much going on in King Street. When we arrived to interview John, it was the lead story in the local paper. John met us at the King Street Junior High School, where he works as a truant officer. He still didn't understand why we had traveled all this way just to interview him. As it turned out, John had never seen the film until our producer, Louis Schmidt, played it for him that day. Okay. Hit the play button and let's see what we got here. One boy is having some problems out there, as you know, uh, John Wilson, coach. Two years away from the game <laughs> have begun to erode his skills. But perhaps an even greater indictment is his difficulty in learning the play. We're going to have to let you go. Mm. We'll have to put you on waivers, but if somebody picks you up, why don't you just work out every day? If you're, if you're not in shape to show the coach, he, he has no idea of your ability because you hadn't seen you before. Okay? True. Thanks, John. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Okay. Oh man, that was a day. Uh, I had, like I guess I had no malice. I, thought, I felt to give me a fair shake because I had been out, and so um, I felt good within myself that I had done the best I could. Did you follow them that season? And when, what did you feel when they they didn't win a game that whole season? Man, I thought maybe that there are some times that you know, like any human being. If I were in a certain situation, I could have helped, but... When, when McKay cut you, and I know you were... That was bad news, right. you were listening to him. Did you have any idea that, that there were cameras around you? No. Never saw the cameras? Well, I, was, I, was, I, was, I had tunnel vision at the time. Tunnel vision as to... So, well, if I'm going back home now, I know what I can do. As soon as I got all my plays down and everything, I get axed. I didn't even get past them. We had the fellas on the team, you know. I called my granddad, you know. I told him, I said, um, Daddy, could you come get me? Because I just got cut. And he got all nervous there. I guess he thought I really got cut with a knife or something, you know. And I said, no, nah, not with a knife. I just got um, cut off the team. <laughs> you know. I tell how he was acting, you know. Well, what did he say? Oh, you hurt? No, nah, first he said, you got what? <laughs> I'm glad you came. I, 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 this, this is me in my year. I can, I can go hairs on my chest now. <laughs> okay, really good. Great. Great. Saver. 
We're looking for a new VP of our Northeast operations. Stop by my office later. Hey, Kevin, aren't you the VP of Northeast operations? Imagine what the journal could do for you. Get eight weeks of the journal for just 38 cents a day, a 50% savings. Call 800-592-9400. That's 800-592-9400. ESPN Classic. Here's a part of Buccaneer history. 25 years ago, this is the jersey that I wore as a Buccaneer back in 1976. And now this jersey has been passed on down to my daughter and to my son. This is the original Parnell Dickinson Buccaneer jersey. Parnell Dickinson was an original Buccaneer. He was the backup quarterback in 1976. He only played one season in Tampa, but he still has a role there on game day. He's the league's designated uniform inspector. It does a lot for me because now I'm still tied to the game somewhat, and I'm working for the league, but I'm, the work that I do is for the team that I once played for. Oh, they're following you, Parnell. 32, pants above his knee. 86 got little whites. He got 92. Socks down, 99. That's every week. Two little things you can look at your house. Other than that, you okay? At each Bucks home game, you'll find Parnell patrolling the field, looking for an untucked jersey here, a flapping towel over there. But back in the days of disco, Parnell was far more concerned with football than fashion. He was one of the first people, other than Leroy Salmon, uh, he was one of the first Buccaneers to be uh, loved by the community. Parnell Dickinson, the only rookie we have, uh, he has a great deal of natural ability. He logically is coming along a little bit slower in the mental part of the thing, but his ability is worth uh, working with. His nickname was Pater, but I think that name may have been given to him by the opposition. You get the idea on this play against the Broncos. I said, Pater, you didn't play very well, did you? We didn't look like it to us. He said, well, I thought I played pretty good. I said, you had three interceptions. He said, I know, but they were high interceptions. They were better interceptions. I said, I've heard better interceptions in my life, Peter. He said, they had to jump up really high to make those interceptions. His interceptions were better. The perfect. word was better interceptions. Just don't come down over the top of that ball. Just relax in there. Just throw the ball real good. Uh, he was an interesting uh, quarterback from the standpoint. He's the first guy that started to run around quite a bit and could run and throw, not just basically a runner. Cornell did like to scramble, and this 46-yard game was the Bucks' longest run of the entire season. When I first saw him, I, th I thought it would take it like anyone. Is I thought it was going to take him two, three years to, to develop into a, a real strong quarterback, but we all thought that he was going to go ahead and, and eventually become the quarterback. <laughs> Parnell never did start a game in Tampa. That's because the Bucks traded for Steve Spurrier, the Heisman Trophy winner from the University of Florida. Spurrier had been a backup quarterback with the 49ers, but his name alone was enough to sell tickets that first season in Tampa. He was a big name to come down there, and uh, I thought he would buy us time, and uh, I realized that was a big mistake because he didn't live up to the expectation of the fans, and it's not so much his fault as what was around him, but only take it so far. I don't know what they all they expected from me. I hadn't done very much in nine years with San Francisco. I think they made the trade just to, you know, have a older, experienced quarterback and, uh, and see what happens. Coach Vince Lombardi one time said, losing, it, uh, winning is a habit, and unfortunately so is losing. Uh, so we were sort of in the habit of losing, and we didn't have a very good team. But we had two or three close games where we had a chance to win, but it, it just didn't work out. No one could have succeeded with the 76 bucks. Certainly not Steve Spurrier, who was rusty after nine years on the bench in San Francisco. But as badly as he was battered, he still started all 14 games. Keep your chin up, we'll be all right. We got some guys over here who won't tackle, that's all. Get, they won't be here a long time. The Tampa Bay uh, Buck Booster Club that was organized in, they actually gave me the most valuable player on the team. And now for a team that went 0-14, and the quarterback to get the award, 
uh, that was probably uh, a pretty neat accomplishment. Spurrier quit the Bucks after just one season. Today, he's the head football coach at Florida, where life is a lot easier. He hasn't had a losing season in 12 years. Obviously, as a head coach at Florida here, uh, I, I do a lot of speaking. And it, it's given me some good joke material, being the quarterback on the losing his team ever. There were seven former Southern Cal players on the Bucks roster, but the one who got the most attention was John McKay's son, J.K., number 89. McKay had two sons in the organization, J.K. here wearing his practice jersey, and Rich, who was a ball boy. J.K. was a productive college receiver, but there were people, both on the Bucks and in the media, who questioned whether he belonged in the NFL. J.K. seemed to sense this when he did this interview in 1976. I don't feel that I have it made by any stretch of the imagination. I, uh, if I'm one of the best four or five or three, whatever they keep, then I'll, then I'll make the team. If not, uh, I'll be on my way. When he joined the team, we didn't, we didn't realize he'd, he'd be a starter, uh, but uh, he went right to the front of the line, and he was one of the starters there. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if they... i just put it this way. I don't think I'd want to coach my son. But John McKay apparently did, and that led to talk of favoritism. J.K. worked hard in practice, had excellent hands, ran good routes. He was somewhat small. As advertised, they said, well, he didn't have great speed, he didn't have great size, but he could catch the ball. Did a lot of the players feel that the reason he made the team was uh, because of his father? Yes. Johnny! The end result in the nepotism issue about my brother, I really think it did bother my, my father. He, you know, he took it a little personally that all of a sudden he's going to play his son over player X. Uh, it bothered him a little bit. I don't think it bothered my brother that much. Still, when you're the coach's son, things can be a little awkward in the locker room. But in spite of that, J.K. did find at least one bright moment in that dismal season. I recall one thing, that I was a starting wide receiver and I was the first player introduced in the history of that franchise, which was kind of cool. But other than that, I don't have any real positive memory. One McKay is still with the club and helping to build it into a Super Bowl contender. That's Rich McKay, who started as a ball boy, then went to Princeton and became a lawyer. He served as the Bucks' legal counsel in 1989 and five years later assumed the role of general manager. He was like a ball boy or uh, whatever, uh, on the sidelines, being a part of it. Always very interested in the game, very bright young man, we all knew that. Rich was, you know, a very young guy who was retrieving balls, you know, for me back then, who was just a kid, and now he runs the entire organization. When you trace it all the way back to 1976, when uh, he was uh, tossing the ball around on the sideline, and, and now he's the general manager of a, a contending team, it's quite an evolution. There's something in the blood, the McKay blood, that uh, is pretty good athletically. I've always loved working on computers, and in the Army, that's what I do. If you never thought about the U.S. Army or Army Reserve, think about this. There are 212 ways for you to become a soldier and work at a job you'll love. Call 1-800-959-ARMY for this free video to find out which job is right for you and discover the 212 ways you can be an Army of One. I love what I do. Access NFL.com for official fantasy football. Get exclusive features and real-time scoring free at NFL.com. On July 30th, 
the Buccaneers flew to Los Angeles for the preseason opener, the first game in franchise history. It's a long flight from Tampa, Florida to, uh, to Los Angeles, and we had chartered this plane called McCullough Airlines, and I'd never heard of McCullough Airlines. The only McCullough I ever heard was Chainsaws. I'm saying, and now there's a McCullough Airlines, I'm a little bit worried right away. For John McKay, it was the return to the scene of his greatest coaching glory. Welcome back to Los Angeles, Coach. Thank you, thank you very much. Glad to be back. John, you've had a chance to see this team now for during the training camp. How good a team are we going to see? <laughs> I have no idea. They, they barely know each other's names. We actually had a lot of fans out here because of my dad primarily, and, and the fact that we had probably a dozen SC players on the team at the time. Going back to my hometown and uh, so many people I know and, and like out there, and I hope some of them like me and are, come to the game. It'll be an unusual thing, I guess, but uh, I'm fully prepared to meet my maker out there. At the LA Coliseum, the teams dress in adjacent locker rooms, and the Buccaneers seem defeated just watching the Rams file out of the door. It was the first glimpse of what was ahead for John McKay that season. The coach agreed to wear a microphone that night. The result was vintage McKay. Equal parts anger and humor. Don't hit him. Don't hit him. Come on, let's hit some leather. Boy, geez. Come on now. Gentlemen, we can't stop a pass or a run. Otherwise, we're in great shape. Well, a hell of a lot of careers going to end Monday. Yeah, let's play everybody. Hell, we're, we're just hard. We're not, we're not proving one thing here. We, we prove we can't play. That's Now let's just play some guys. Huh? Hey, Matt. You run with the football. There's another damn chicken we got out of here. That's what I say. We got so many cooks and no, no salad. Yeah, yeah, I would figure that you would stagger around. What's wrong with playing Mon in the game? He tackles. He's only got one chance to make his football team, and he acts like he's got it made. He ain't got nothing made. The biggest thing I remember was the sideline. The sideline issue. <laughs> Coach always wanted the guys back from the sideline. You can't be on the sideline. You've got to be back, and the guys were never back. Back up, fellas. Back up, please, so we can see. Is there any way that we can get these people to sit down? He was screaming, you know, who's in charge of the sideline? And, of course, nobody wanted to be in charge of the sideline. And then he turned around, and he said, I'm cutting everybody that's close to the sideline. Everybody that's near the sideline is cut. If I don't get them down, I will cut them, baby, so they'll be down. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't think that's going to Coach. You want to go with quarterback, Coach? Uh, let's go with Parnell. Parnell, you're going on the next series. Late in the game, it appeared the Bucks had scored their first ever touchdown on a run by backup quarterback Parnell Dickinson. I recall the touchdown being called back because uh, I believe think somebody was holding on the play. But those types of things happened all year long. I mean, at every game there was something <laughs> that would go wrong. It was a broken play. It was a scramble play. And uh, he was very, very upset with uh, the execution of the offense in that game. Bunch of UCLA rejects beat me. I always felt that that was so hard for him to return to a place where he had had so much success and to walk in there and know that uh, it wasn't going to turn out the way he wanted it to. That had to be hard. Gentlemen, I would hope to hell we could play more aggressive football. I have never seen a team tackle this poorly in football in my whole life. 27 years of coaching, that's the worst exhibition of tackling. Coach, what do you think of your uh, professional debut? What's it like in the professional ranks? Anything special? Well, we didn't block, no. but we made up for it by not tackling. Attack on New York on September 11 caused a lot of turmoil and fear. Among those who suffered a severe loss of confidence are our young people. We can help by talking honestly to children, assuring them that they are safe, and by explaining that there are only a few bad people, therefore bad things don't happen very often. We can restore confidence in children by demonstrating our own courage and ability to overcome. Most importantly, we should never let them feel like they are the victim. We Americans are going through a tragic time. We all have painful emotions following these hideous events. Here are some ways to get through this time of crisis. Please ask for help if you want it. Avoid repetitive viewing of the terrible images. And do something. Donate money, donate blood, volunteer. For more information, contact your local American Red Cross chapter or visit our website. Together, we can save a life. Sunday on ESPN Classic. Sometimes the only thing worth fighting for. I gotta do something for my boy. Is love. All I wanted to be with you. 
John Voight. What about my life? What about my life? Faye Dunaway and Ricky Schroeder. Yeah, wake up! Wake up! Wake up! Star in a real classic, The Champ. 9 p.m. Sunday, only on ESPN Classic. Number 53 is Larry Ball. 25 years ago, he was a linebacker for the Bucks. Today, he coaches badminton at Croft High School in Cooper City, Florida. Short serve. Your short serve is to make them pop it up. Now, we haven't confirmed this, but we feel pretty confident in saying Larry is the first football player to go from the shuttle run to the shuttle cock. One thing we do know is he's the only NFL player to experience the high of an undefeated season and the low of a winless season. That's because prior to joining the Bucks, he played for Don Shula's 17-0 Miami Dolphins in 1972. I had that little trivia question where I'm the only person to two have done that. It's nice to be able to say that I have something that's mine. Leroy Selman stands alone in the history of the Tampa Bay franchise. He was the team's first ever pick in the 1976 draft, and today he is the only Buccaneer enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Picking Leroy Selman was the only easy decision Ron Wolfe had to make that first season. We had the first pick in the country, and Leroy Selman, we think he's going to be an outstanding professional football player, probably played 10, 15 years. I was very excited. I remember the nervousness of oh, just the butterflies coming in. Selman played nine seasons with the Bucks, and when the team made the playoffs in 1979, he was one of the few holdovers from the original roster. You could see that there was another level that you were competing against that was much more required of you. If Leroy had one fault as a football player, it was his gentle nature. There were coaches who felt he could have been even greater if he were more like his brother, Dewey. To be here with my brother was totally unexpected. As we were graduating out of Oklahoma University, we were told by everybody we would never play together again. That happened. That was exciting. Leroy is a little bit nicer than Dewey. And if you were laying on the ground, Leroy's going to jump over you and Dewey's going to step on you. You know what I mean? So when we got both of them, it was a real pick. He was our one star that we had at the time was uh, Leroy. And uh, if he had played on a major market team, every household would have talked about him. But he became an all-pro and a Hall of Famer anyway. So that tells you how strong he was. It's been said that it would be very hard for me to um, get into the National Football League Hall of Fame for a lot of reasons. He said you have not participated in a, a Super Bowl. You've not been on a championship team. And all those things are true. I'm so appreciative of someone in Tampa Bay who always put a sign in the corner of the end zone that says Leroy Selman for the Hall of Fame. I don't know who that was, but that is very special. Shows you kind of, kind of people that live in the Tampa Bay area. This weekend, Enterprise Rent-A-Car announces special low rates from just $9.99 a day. Friday till Monday from just $9.99 a day. Pick Enterprise. We'll pick you up. Circuit City presents Expo 2001. 30 days of what's new, what's hot, and what's next. Featuring live demos of HDTV, digital photography, high-speed internet access, and more. All this month at Circuit City. Circuit City, we're with you. A special announcement from the American Property Network. You can buy cars for as low as $29 per month. Choose from thousands of cars repossessed and seized by the U.S. Marshal, IRS, FBI, and private organizations. Call 1-800-370-2060. Foreclosed homes and distressed properties are selling for as low as $199 per month. Call 1-800-370-2060. For current auction listings, call 1-800-370-2060. Call toll-free. Hank Greenberg was a tough Jew when tough Jews were important. Hank Greenberg, Fourth Century Wednesday. He felt every home run he hit in 1938 was a home run against Hitler. To call him a kite would earn you a punch in the mouth. People did not expect Jews to be good athletes. The single seasons that he had were phenomenal. He gave to the name Jew an honor, a nobility, a dignity. Hank Greenberg. Sports Century, the top 15 and beyond, 8 p.m. Wednesday. Only on ESPN Classic. John McKay won four national championships at USC. He wrote books and lectured on the science of winning. But none of that prepared him for his first season in Tampa. 
14 league games, 14 losses. There's never been another season like it. 10 yards is not very far on a football field, but with our offense, when we broke the huddle, it may as well have been a mile. I remember late in the season, we had to go to up to Pittsburgh, play the Steelers with Bradshaw, Mel Blunt, Lynn Swan, Franco Harris, and that one of the greatest teams in the history of the NFL. I, I don't think I've ever gone on a field feeling less confident in that we would somehow get a win. We played them tough. I think we lost 42 to nothing. They could have named the score. I mean, they, they were so much better than we were. And then there were jokes made about us, and we were the, the butt of jokes around the country, around the world. And the comedians like Johnny Carson uh, on a nightly basis would have uh, uh, jokes about the Buccaneers. Uh, we were very often uh, on, on his show, and he was a part of his monologue. At least he's talking about us, you know? He's not talking about the Rams or the Bears or somebody else. He's talking about our football team. The Bucks knew when they faced Seattle in week six, it might be their only chance for a win. You see, the Seahawks were also a first-year team, and both clubs were 0-5 when they met in what the press called the Expansion Bowl. This was kind of the measuring stick. We both came in at the same time. We're, you know, let's see where we are. Where, how are we compared to them? I thought, personally, that we match up well against this team, and I think this is going to be our first win. I mean, you really go in there with this attitude, we're going to win the game. Covenant, we're going to win the game. The game went back and forth. Neither team was really good enough to win. But the Bucks were just bad enough to lose. I think of all the losses we took, that was the hardest. It was horrible. The guys were totally depressed. I think it was probably the lowest point of the year. I can remember crying after that game, and uh, it's just like, I can't believe it. I, I can't believe we didn't win this game. I think that was like the final dagger when, when we didn't get Seattle, and we knew that this was uh, definitely a possibility of not winning any. That's when it first set in that, my goodness, we're going to go through this whole thing and never win a game. What a disgrace that is. Toward the end of that year, you know, you were beginning to kind of wonder, well, you know, the odds got to be in our favor to win a game. Just purely on odds, for the sake of odds, we should win one game here, but it didn't happen. Supermarket floor, they can make for nasty slips and falls. Hi, I'm Al Mangoni, a safety specialist with Liberty Mutual Insurance. There's no reason the supermarket floor should ever be a dangerous place. So we're working on non-slip flooring and other materials to keep you safe. Liberty Mutual. It's more than insurance. It's insurance in action. I also hate bananas. marks the silver anniversary of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But there are no ceremonies planned to honor that 76 team. No reunions, no parades. It may just be that this film is the only recognition they receive. I'm kind of sad that they're not going to honor the team. I think what the team went through together, you know, with that losing season is unique in the annals of pro football and probably all sport. Most of us knew we weren't, you know, we weren't on the way to the Hall of Fame and that when and if the team got to be really good, uh, most of us probably wouldn't be around anymore. It was a very close-knit group for that reason. Even though they weren't the greatest memories in the world, they are memories and a lot of good things came out of that. A lot of the things that happened to us made us better people for it. Of course, we would love to have been undefeated rather than winless, but we had, we had some great times and I made some great friends along the way, and we built something that was really good. Just for the record, 
The Bucks didn't win a regular season game until December of their second season. Their losing streak had reached 26 games by then. They finally beat the Saints in New Orleans, and when they flew home, there were 5,000 fans waiting at the airport to greet them. ESPN Classic thanks you for watching this presentation of the National Football League. The NFL is online at NFL.com. For more, log on to ESPN.com. You're watching ESPN Classic.